everyone. Good morning. And welcome in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. A few announcements as we prepare for worship this morning. First of all, uh, welcome also to those of you who are watching on Facebook. Uh, be sure you uh, sign in by leaving a comment that you are watching. And if you're watching with somebody, make sure all the names get there because that's how we take attendance. Uh, also, those of you online, if you have a prayer request, you can put it in the comments. The sooner the better so that we know that it's there when it comes around to prayer time. Uh, the uh, COVID infection rate continues to drop. We were the last county in northeast Indiana, but we've gone to 0.5. So that's great. There are no longer any COVID-19 restrictions in place. But if uh, you feel the need, feel free to wear a mask to not shake hands and all that sort of thing just people will understand they will uh, for the month of march our second mile monthly mission giving emphasis is the manchester fellowship of churches uh, the funds we give are split between their three ministries the uh, thrift store uh, reach which uh, helps people pay their utility bills uh, and the food pantry um, a special opportunity today it's in your bulletin toward the back is uh, the, uh, at the uh, Liberty Mills Church of the Brethren, 6 o'clock this evening, will be a uh, live presentation. Uh, they use uh, Da Vinci's uh, uh, painting of the Last Supper as kind of their setting, and then each one of the disciples uh, gives a uh, soliloquy, a part of the story. Um, uh, I, uh, I haven't been to this. They haven't done it in, in a couple of years, but... Uh, Deborah, our Ministry of Assistance, says she's been, and it's very good. This is like the sixth or seventh time they've done it. So uh, that should be fun if you'd like to take part in that this afternoon. Uh, also, uh, a reminder that church count camp information is out, and uh, there's a brochure in the library. Uh, we also have uh, two potentially confusing opportunities coming up, but... Uh, as most of you are, are probably aware, there's a war going on in the Ukraine. And uh, I saw two different numbers today, but it's uh, somewhere between three and four million refugees. And uh, one of the key differences in a refugee and, and somebody else is you'll leave without much more than the clothes on your back. So uh, UMCOR is very active. They aren't in Ukraine because of the war, but they're uh, uh, almost all the... Uh, countries surrounding Ukraine has a United Methodist presence, and so UMCOR is working through those churches and uh, trying to help them help uh, the refugees. So and ref any, they help anybody. You don't have to be a part of the UMC. But uh, one of the big things about giving to UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, is that 100% of what you give goes to that project. They don't cut anything out of that to cover their overhead. And the reason they can do that is because of the special offering next Sunday, which is UMCOR Sunday. Uh, happens to, always falls on the fourth Sunday of uh, uh, Lent. Uh, so yes, we are taking up for Ukraine, but the importance of this uh, offering on UMCOR Sunday is that's all the money they get to pay for their overhead. Now, well, UMCOR only, I'm told, only has about 15 employees. Um, Everybody else, uh, if they pay them, they're on contract for a specific disaster relief or they're volunteers. Most people, of course, are volunteers that help with UMCOR. Uh, so they don't have near the uh, overhead that many agencies that help people have. Uh, but that uh, offering next Sunday is important. So uh, you have two opportunities for several weeks we'll be take collecting for Ukraine. So if you want your gift to go to that, make sure it says Ukraine. That's probably more important than saying UMCOR. Next Sunday, we'll be having UMCOR Sunday offering. And that money goes for their overhead because they get nothing from the denomination or anywhere else. That's the money they have. So it's an important offering. So uh, just if you have any questions, give me a call or Larry Cottrell, our finance chair, and we'll try to help you uh, figure that out. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Seeing none, let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude. 
Good morning, church family. Good to see everyone this morning. If you're able, will you please stand and join with me in the call to worship? God is calling each one of us to ministry. If you answer the summons, your life will be totally changed. People may not understand and may ridicule us. Lord, we come with willing hearts today to learn how to fulfill the promises given to the people. Make us ready, O Lord, to be true disciples, offering ministries of hope and compassion. Our opening hymn is Lord of the Dance. The words will be on the screen and in your hymnal on page 261.
Please join with me in the opening prayer. Gracious God, we come to you this day seeking your guidance and strength. You have called us to ministries for which we feel inadequate. Help us to understand that it is your love that will support and sustain our efforts. Give us the courage to place our trust in your abiding presence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In our first lesson taken from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us that love is essential for the Christian life. If I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I am a clanging gong on a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything that I have and hand over my own body to feel good about what I've done, but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Love is patient, love is kind, it isn't jealous, it doesn't brag, it isn't arrogant, it isn't rude, it doesn't seek its own advantage, it isn't irritable, it doesn't keep a record of complaints, it isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. You may remain seated as we sing our hymn of preparation. I have decided to follow Jesus. The words will be on the screen. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. In our lesson taken from the first chapter of Mark, Jesus begins his ministry by first dedicating himself to righteous living. Then he invites others to join him. About that time, Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee and John baptized him in the Jordan River. While he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw heaven spitting down, splitting open, and the spirit like a dove coming down on him. And there was a voice from heaven, You are my son, whom I dearly love, in you I find happiness. At once the spirit forced Jesus out of the, into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan. He was among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. As Jesus passed alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away they left their nets and followed him. After going a little farther, he saw James and John, 
Zebedee's sons, in their boat repairing the fishing nets. At that very moment he called them. They followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers. Jesus and his followers went into Capernaum. Immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and started teaching. The people were amazed by his teaching, for he was teaching them with authority, not like the legal experts. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. You may be seated. So last week we began our journey into the New Testament section of the book, The Story, that we've been using since last August. We have nine more Sundays to go. Last week we witnessed the birth of Jesus. Not something we usually do in, during Lent or in March, but that's the way it went. And the story we read last week concludes with Jesus visiting the temple at around age 12, where he astounded the priests with his teaching. The next thing we hear of him is the story today. He's a grown man. He's baptized by John in the Jordan River. So chapter 23 of the story begins and ends with John the Baptist. John is the forerunner and the affirmer of the unique ministry Jesus would demonstrate through his life, his deeds, his teaching. And John is truly the link person between the Old Testament and the New Testament. With Jesus declaring that John the Baptist is the Elijah figure who would pave the way for a a whole new experience of God's love in the world. Jesus, when he's baptized by John, is not baptized like the rest of us for forgiveness of sin, but it's a commissioning for his service. It's a way of identifying himself with all of humanity. Jesus is then led into a period of temptation in the wilderness from which he emerges as the one who can counteract all the wiles of the devil. The stage is now set for him to begin his ministry. Now, in the earliest portions of the Gospels, what we find is that Jesus lays down a pattern for his ministry. That ministry that would later become the mission of the church. We also hear him declare the purpose for his ministry. And we discover who the people are that he calls to walk with him in this ministry. And today we'll look at that. Pattern, purpose, and people. So early in Jesus' ministry, this a threefold pattern for ministry emerges. The pattern of deliverance, healing and forgiveness. When Jesus goes to teach at the synagogue in Capernaum, a man possessed by an impure spirit cries out, Have you come to destroy us? We know who you are, the Holy One of God. As Jesus travels throughout Galilee, we read of numerous encounters with spirits who who cry out, You are the Son of God. And in each instance, Jesus fulfills the petition we speak every week from the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. Exposing and calling out evil, be it on an individual or a corporate level, it's it's always been a part of the mission of God. From Old Testament encounters with idolatry and unfaithfulness to present-day encounters with racism and poverty and injustice, the the church, in Jesus' name, is, is called to challenge all deathly powers of evil that cheapen and destroy life. 
We declare that, that people be delivered from cycles of poverty and, and incessant need and violence. We seek to destroy powers that make simple existence in this world an experience of hell on earth. Closely related to deliverance is healing. Drive around any city, not just in the U.S., in the Western world, and you'll see hospitals dedicated to Saint this or Saint that, or to denominations, Methodist hospital, Baptist hospital, Jewish hospital. You see, you, you'll encounter medical services that would not exist without Christ's mandate that his people reach out with healing hands. Be it in medical research, be it down at the local food pantry, be it at a work camp in a disaster area, be it medical missions across the globe, even in war zones. It's such part and parcel of the gospel message that to say the gospel message is about healing is, well, I'm stating the obvious. In fact, the, the first part of the word salvation is salve, a word we use to describe an ointment that brings healing, but, but also has the wider meaning of, of soothing, to, to ease, to lighten, to alleviate, to comfort. From Simon's mother-in-law to the crowd so deep that a paralyzed man has to be lowered through the roof. From children to victims of leprosy, the Gospels offer page after page, story after story of healing. But healing is not simply a matter of, of physical health. The third strand of Jesus' ministry pattern is that of forgiveness. The leper was ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. The woman with an issue of blood is considered outside God's circle of acceptance. To the paralyzed man, Jesus declares, your sins are forgiven. An act which causes those who oppose Jesus to cry blasphemy. Deliverance, healing, forgiveness, they complement each other. and Each is a part of God's original intention for our life that we be made whole physically, mentally, and spiritually. Which is a convenient way of moving into thinking about the purpose of ministry. Nowhere is that purpose more clearly stated in the third chapter of, of John. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. From page one, way back in the book of Genesis, the story we've spoken about, there being an upper story, the story of, of God's desire for all humankind. And from the beginning, it's been the same story. God desires for us to live in unbroken fellowship in relationship with God and with one another. And that is now made gloriously possible through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. Everyone is invited. No one is excluded. Nowhere is that clearer than in the stories of Nicodemus and the woman of Samaria. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, he's the ultimate insider, a devout Jew who, who has at least within his measure, kept the law his whole life. He is a man with a good heart who has studied the law and is desperate 
for God's love. Jesus praises him for his growth and understanding, but also outlines to him that it's, it's not through our own striving that we gain the love of God, but that we need to be born from above, born again by the work of God's grace, the action of God's spirit. It has to be that way, because that's the only way that levels the playing field for all of us. It's only by grace that an outsider, like the Samaritan woman at the well, will ever have the hope of knowing the love of God. As Jesus talks with her, it becomes obvious he can, he can see right into her soul. He knows the troubling times this woman has faced in her life. She's the ultimate outsider. That's why she came to the well in the heat of the day. Because she knew no one else would be there to accuse her or condemn her. While Jesus asks her for water to drink, Jesus offers to her living water. The living water of, of his acceptance, his, his love, and his presence in her life. That's what we all need, right? Not the stagnant water of everyday experience, but the living water of God's Holy Spirit. When we gather around the communion table, we talk about Jesus being the living bread, the substance of what life is all about. And we drink the wine of the new covenant to express how his life his death and his resurrection continue to nourish and refresh and revitalize our lives now and forever. This was God's eternal purpose in sending Jesus to us. That through his life, our lives can become deeply rooted in God's love. The purpose of ministry is that our lives maybe all that God intended them to be. That we find that our lower story is in line with God's upper story. And our pattern for ministry today is, is no different than what we read in the Gospels. Deliverance, healing, forgiveness. But who are the people to let everybody know about this great and good news. In the early chapters of each of the Gospels, we see Jesus putting his team together. We know them historically as the 12 disciples, but we know there, there weren't only 12 who followed Jesus. And those 12 that get named, well, they're not the only ones who were faithfully following Jesus. Actually, at the, in the end, only one gospel reports that only one of Jesus' male followers was left standing at the crucifixion. The rest had disappeared, run away. Only the women, who barely get mentioned elsewhere, are faithful enough to be there. We receive mention of many other faithful folk. I mentioned Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. There's Joseph who gave up his tomb. The father of the daughter Jesus raised to life. The leper who came back to say thank you after he'd been healed. And Mary and Martha and Lazarus and the list goes on and on. For sure, there are some who, who we know received a, a special calling to, to get the show on the road. But you know, they were a pretty motley crew. One of them even turned traitor. Another one, presumably the leader, denied having ever known Jesus. And still another, even after everybody else had said, 
He's alive. Just flat, plain out, didn't believe. And one of the most famous of all, Saul of Tarsus, never even knew Jesus until after the resurrection. Our topic today is, begin, is that Jesus' ministry began. We're all here today because Jesus' ministry began. But the story doesn't end there and it doesn't end here. It's an ongoing story. But it's a story that, that is dependent upon one thing. It, it needs one more thing. The same thing that God's kingdom from the very beginning has depended upon and that's you you faithful people people who respond to what God has done for them in their lives by sharing God's love with others people who are prepared to follow the example of Jesus in leading the way in, in ministries of deliverance and healing and forgiveness people who know that it is by grace alone that, that they can make it through life. People who know what it is to be born from above in response to God's love. That's why we're here today. To learn how to be the people of God. To receive afresh God's Holy Spirit in our hearts to be inspired to, to work and, and to live and to be the people of God for our day and our time, for our families and our communities, for our schools, our places of work. We are the ministry. We are the carriers of the love of God, the hope of the world. What do we learn from the beginning of Jesus' ministry? We learn a pattern for ministry. We see how Jesus leads the way in ministries of deliverance, healing, and forgiveness. We read of the purpose of ministry. God is seeking to make our lives whole. That any estrangement we feel from his love is, is erased by the grace of Christ Jesus. And that we may serve God's kingdom freely and forgiven, overflowing with the new wine of eternal hope. And finally, Jesus' memory. Jesus' ministry begins with the people of God in ministry. That's you, that's me, that's all of us. Saints past, saints presence, present and yet to come. Wherever we are, whatever we do, may we find a way to allow God's love to be a significant part of it so that others will get the message that they too are loved, that they too are accepted, and they too are desired by the God who gave us all life in the first place. The beginning of Jesus' ministry is the groundwork upon we, which we can build our so be it. Our response to God's word is to share our joys and concerns for God and one another. A few updates I have to give. Um, first of all, we have a stranger in the front pew. I'd like to... Uh, uh, oh, it's... Uh, what is your name? 
Pam, her, his wife's name's Pam. <gasps> Terry, yeah, Terry McKee. Uh, which, when I saw him this morning, told me something important. That means Pam's doing better. So, she's not well yet, but she is doing better. Um, still has the aftermath of pneumonia, still getting over the back surgery, but uh, um, I joked with Terry, she, he said, uh, for the first time in two years, she's able to get into bed and sleep with him. And I said, oh, good, and we didn't even have to do um, marriage counseling for that. So that's good. It's, it's good to have both of you doing better. I uh, got an update on Fratsy French, still on the uh, ventilator, not able to get her off, but she's being moved out of the hospital to uh, a, uh, a rehab hospital. Um, Let's see, uh, Nick Sanson had successful surgery uh, to remove skin cancer on the back of his neck, and uh, he was gonna be off work three weeks because he wasn't gonna be able to lift anything, but he went back to the doctor Friday, uh, two days later, and the doctor said, hey, it's healing fine. You can go back to work Monday. So he probably went, darn. But anyway, um, uh, also uh, Valerie Clarkson, who uh, got some confusing word and a mammogram six months ago, saw a specialist this past week, and uh, even though there is something going on, he doesn't think it's cancer, and he, he uh, or is a she, actually, she uh, recommended continuing observation for now. So uh, Valerie's just glad to have that, somebody tell her what's really going on. Uh, got word yesterday that Todd Richards had toe surgery on uh, Friday. Uh, and he has to stay off his foot for six weeks. Um, he does have a, a cart to ride around on. He has one of those knee carts, but uh, apparently there's a learning clerk curve, so he didn't make it today, but they're hoping to be here next week. He uh, said he can also, all, he can receive visitors, so he'd love to have them. Um, Uh-oh, I have the information, but I didn't get the last name. Okay, uh, J uh, Jane Heights, Nieces, son-in-law, Matt, and it's a Slavic name that I couldn't pronounce even if it was in front of me, was one of the four Marines killed uh, in the NATO training exercise in Norway uh, Friday. Uh, so uh, sometimes things that happen a long way away do hit home. So um, keep that family in your prayers. Do we have any other joys or concerns that you'd like to share today? Yeah, I have, have, what they hear me, okay. I have to say I am so pleased to be back in the, the house of the Lord. I mean, after three months, and I tell you, it's been a, been a heck of a three months. Um, probably four or five hospital stays for Pam, and uh, 23 days of two bodies of physical therapy. And, um, but she's getting on the mend. She's, she's, she can do more than what she's been able to do. And, and as we have our daily devotions, and I think that's, that's what's the one good thing about all of this is that it's brought us closer together as a couple and closer to Jesus. Um, it's just wonderful, you know, what, what he can do. And um, it's just really hard to watch your spouse for 54 years and go through this and know that there's nothing you can do but just sit and just pray. But um, well, we thank you and the church family for all the wonderful notes and the, the cards. and They just come at the right time, I'll tell you. So anyway, I just, I just start there and it's a complete joy. Thank you so much. Somebody else. Uh, Pam Bart, let's see, I have, I have a prayer request, request from Pam, by the way. Um, she's saying, please pray for, for comfort for the family of Elda Epley, who passed last week. She's the brother of her, she's the mother of her brother-in-law, Bill Epley. Um, uh, joy to share that our daughter Lindsay seems to be fully recovered from whatever that residual effect of COVID had on her. Um, 
she went skiing last weekend and even up in those higher altitudes, no breathing issues, no sheer exhaustion like she had been dealing with, no chest pain, all that. So um, major blessing there. Um, we had prayed for my sister Kathy daily. Um, she finally she finally had her MRI and got the results. She has a bulging disc and some de degeneration of a disc. Um, doctor sent her to a neurosurgeon. Neurosurgeon gave her the option of do, going in and doing surgery or attempting with um, injections first to see how that helps. She decided to go the route of injections. However, her insurance company is dragging their feet on approving it. So she's still in a lot of misery, um, but she has answers at least and, and hope is on the way. You forgot to mention, Grandma, that the best part of Lindsay feeling better and going skiing is you got to go and spend five days with the granddaughter in Atlanta. The only one, only other one there, so she got 100% time. Uh, can't be quick, and I just wanted uh, prayers for my mom. She's on her way back from Ohio, and just give her travel mercies. She was over there um, visiting our, some of our family, and her aunt, I think, she's in her late 90s, so be my great aunt. So just travel mercies. Anyone else? Oh, anything else from Facebook? No. Oh, all right then. Uh, the uh, church we're praying for this week is, I turned it off, there we go. St. Bellarmine, uh, Robert Bellarmine Catholic Church here in town, Father uh, Dennis, I don't bother, I don't try to pronounce his last name. I've gotten to know him quite a bit in the last year. He's, he's a lot of fun. Um, much younger than I am and sees the world a little differently, so we enjoy having coffee once in a while. Got uh, coffee scheduled for Tuesday morning, so uh, that should be a lot of fun. But, uh, the card we send is in the back if you'd like to sign it on your way out, if you haven't already. And please keep them in your prayers this week. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, as we gather today, we come because you have called us. Called us to, to be different in the world. To be born again from above through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we know that makes us different. We also know, Lord, that we struggle at times with that difference. Because that difference means that we live with Jesus at the center of who we are. Sometimes we'd prefer to have ourselves there or some other idol, something else that we make so important that we would push Jesus out. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to be like Jesus. Who gave of himself without without anything in return, often without even a thank you. He never asked who was worthy. Simply, do you want to be made whole? Lord, make us whole. Fill us with your spirit that we can do the work of Christ in this world. That we can 
be a part of the ministry of deliverance, healing, and forgiveness. And when we fail, Lord, forgive us as you would have us forgive others. Free us, Lord, to be your people in this world, to be set aside, to be recognized as other, even, Lord, sometimes to be ostracized for it. Help us to never let that deter us from sharing your love. Everywhere we are, every moment of our lives. For that is the ministry that Jesus calls us to. And now, Lord, as your disciples, hear us as we lift our voices in the prayer that you taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our worship now with the giving of our tithes and our offering. Uh, for those of you here, uh, the ushers will uh, pass the plate to you. For those of you watching online, um, we love getting your support in the mail, so keep it coming. Uh, and we give thanks for that. Um, had the finance committee meeting the other night, and uh, let's just say we, we had fun. Just something you don't always have at a finance committee meeting. Um, our offertory sentence today comes from the 16th chapter of Proverbs. Better to be humble with the needy than to divide plunder with the proud. Those with insight find prosperity. Those who trust the Lord are blessed. Let us ponder these words as we give our offering. <laughs>
by your blessings we are fed, we are clothed, we are who we are. And we give thanks that we can give our blessing to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Please stand as we sing our hymn of invitation, Jesus Calls Us. The words will be on the screen and in your hymnal on page 398. Please join me in our blessing. Go now and live in the spirit of your baptism, even when you are led into wild and hard places. With repentance and trust, we give ourselves to God. Through the fasting and prayer, we strengthen ourselves against the ways of the tempter. And may God enfold you in tender and lasting love. May Christ be beside you in times of struggle. And may the Spirit guide you back to the path whenever you stray, that you may keep the covenant. With loving deeds, to love and to serve God in the name of Christ. And we go knowing that we have been filled with the love of God so that we may fill the world with the love of God through Jesus Christ. 